Hello and welcome back to the 52 week Bible challenge. I'm Donovan. I'm Kelly. And this week we have Galatians 1 through 2. Uh, we are going to be studying about Paul's conversion uh, and about being justified by faith and not by the law and also about being crucified with Christ. Since we have two full chapters, probably won't read all of it, but just kind of give go by chunk by chunk. Mm -hmm. We have verses one through four. It's an intro. It's sometimes easy to skip over these, but there's important parts in there too. Yeah, I think a big important part here that we see is Paul talking about his apostleship. That's mm -hmm. actually a theme that we see in this chapter. So Paul is an apostle and an apostle simply means one who has been sent. And Paul is an apostle not sent by men, but by sent through Jesus Christ and through God the Father. So he's going to talk, we're going to get more into that, his conversion yeah. and how that happened and why he's not an apostle sent by men, but he is through Christ. Even though he wasn't one of Christ's disciples when Christ was doing his ministry on the earth, Paul kind of got a special commission on the road to Damascus. And so we're going to learn more about that. And then in verse two, it's important to note, it says to the churches in Galatia. So Galatia is a region which in what is now modern day Turkey, they were ruled by Rome at the time. But this letter is to multiple churches. So they would have been passing this letter around. I love at the end of verse four in this intro that Paul is giving, he says, we've been rescued from this present evil age. That's a promise. I just wrote that in my Bible as a sideline, something to highlight and note. You've been rescued from this present evil age. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, and it goes on to say, according to the will of your God and mm -hmm. Father, because I actually wrote it was God's will to deliver mm. us from the present evil age. Like this is something God wanted to do. It's not like a residual side effect. This was his intention was to deliver us from this evil age. And That's good. there's a lot of evil. It seems like it grows more and more evil as time goes on, yeah. but the reality is we know who wins in the end. So and speaking of evil, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that. Speaking of evil though, Paul goes on in verses six through 10 to talk about the perversion of the gospel. We'll probably read some of these here. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So this is something we have to guard ourselves from even now today. There's so much information out there. I, I, I'm not going to even start listing it all. Right. But even in, the, even in the intro there, he gave us the, what the gospel is for that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins so that we might be rescued. Right. And I think that's important to remember that there are false gospels and we we need to know what the truth is. That's why we do this. That's why yeah. we're doing the 52 week Bible challenge to understand what does the Bible tell us? What did Jesus actually say? What did the apostles actually write? These are the things that we need to know because the world is going to twist the gospel. It's, it's Satan's going to come and he's going to lie and he's going to twist it to say, oh, that's not really true. Or you need Jesus plus works. You, he's going to tell you all sorts of things. So. Paul's, again, reaffirming these things in our life uh, for us, and we get the benefit of this letter so we can know the truth. But these Galatians at the time apparently were, were falling into deception, so he's addressing that in this letter. And spoiler alert, as we get at the end of chapter two, even Peter kind of distorts the gospel. So stay tuned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to point out verse 10 before we go on. Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We've seen this term bondservant come up the past couple weeks, and it means to be a voluntary servant of Christ. So if he's voluntarily saying, I'm with you till the end for Christ, then he can't be aiming to please men as well. And that reminded me of the verse in, in the Gospels that says you can't have two masters, and that's talking about God and money. But I saw that same principle applied here. You can't have two masters as far as trying to be a people pleaser and a God pleaser. Like, they don't exist. You, you can't accomplish both at the same time. Yeah. I think that's a 
that's important, something to think about when you're looking for a church or when you're looking for a pastor to come under. The, the reason why you need to be careful is because there are a lot of people pleasers out there. And Jesus even talked about that. They, they just want to hear things that tickle their ears or, you know, yeah. and that is a lot of what we see in society today. Oh, I go to this church because the preaching makes me feel good. But I think it's important to know, like, it's not just a, watching out for a different gospel, but watching out for an incomplete gospel as well, right? Like that we are sinners, we deserve to go to hell, but Jesus died and resurrected to take our punishment on himself so we don't have to, right? Like that's the, you know, that's the full gospel, Some people, and that it's by believing in him through faith and not works. Though Those are the things that are indisputable. So if somebody comes in and says, oh, well, Jesus was a great teacher, but he wasn't really God, or Jesus didn't really raise from the dead, or if somebody comes in and says, oh, well, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you also have to follow these 500 steps to salvation, they're all preaching something other than the gospel that Christ preached and different than what Paul is teaching. And he has some pretty strong words, even in verse eight. I wanted to read yeah. those. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. He basically says the same thing twice. You see the same thing twice in the Bible that is like bold, italicized, double underlined, big font, like this is important. And I, I'd i say those are pretty strong words for people that are not preaching the whole gospel or not preaching the same gospel that Paul is preaching. This is why I think it's best to stick as close to scripture when you're, when you're preaching or teaching as possible, as opposed to maybe pastors who don't read out of the Bible a whole lot and they'll, or they'll, they'll take one passage out of context and build a whole sermon around it. But that, that could be dangerous because now you're not looking at the whole gospel or you're twisting scripture to fit your own, your own way. And mm. the word accursed is very, that's a very powerful, powerful word. Um, I mean, it basically means like damn to hell, watch out for those. And we, there's different, flavors of that even in today you've got your progressives you've got um you've got your prosperity gospel you've got your cults um that are uh your christian christian cults all of those preach warped and twisted gospels so yikes yeah so then we go on to the next section and paul talks about him being called and how he was converted and and how he was qualified to be an apostle and i think this is a really cool story uh, I know you and I were having a conversation before this about how's this line up with Acts 9, because Acts 9 is when Paul is converted in the book of Acts and it gives an account. And then Paul is giving basically a different account here, but it's it's a, a different account of the same story. It just gives some different details, a uh, different timeline, you know, a timeline that's maybe a little bit more um, descriptive than the timeline that Luke, who's the author of Acts, wrote about in the book of Acts. So there's a couple themes that are important, I think, that come out of this. And the first one is I, in verse 12. For, he's talking about, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul's basically saying nobody taught Paul all of this stuff that he's teaching us. No one taught him this. This is what God revealed to him. Now, he talks a little bit um, more in 13 and 14 about how he was uh, advancing in Judaism way ahead of his peers and was very zealous. And so he was very well, well versed in the scriptures and following the law and being zealous for God. But then Jesus comes along and basically redirects that knowledge so that it can be used for the gospel. Paul had a lot of head knowledge about the scriptures. And then Jesus essentially unlocks that through the Holy Spirit and through direct revelation from Jesus to say, great, I sh now I'm showing you all these things. Paul learns all this through Jesus and he reveals it to him over several years. Then on verse 15, he says, but when he who said, set me apart before I was born and who called me by this grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, 
in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. And in verse 15, when it says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, really shows that there was an understanding. Paul knew that God had set him apart for this, for this mission, for this purpose. But there's a timing in our calling with God. Like just because we're called um, to something or that we have an anointing or God has given us anointing doesn't mean that it's for right now. It might be something that God is pre preparing us for for later or has work to do for us. Maybe you're a young person and you feel like, oh, God's calling me to be a pastor. Well, great. That was great if God is calling you to that. But is God calling you to be a pastor right now? Or is God putting that on your heart for something to do in the future and wants you to prepare for it? Because we see that happening here in Paul's life. Like he knows that he's called to do something for big for God because God has, and he's kind of knowing that for a long time because he was so zealous. You know, he just kind of was mm. pointed in the wrong direction and God <laughs> had to redirect his zealousness to back to what Jesus wanted to use it for. Mm. But our callings have a time. And when God says it's time, we want to move with God in his timing and not move ahead or leg behind where God's timing is in our lives. That's a good point. In my version at the end of 16, it says, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. And so I thought, you know, Paul received spiritual knowledge and therefore he didn't consult with the flesh. Just more, ever since we studied in Romans, this, this idea of flesh and spirit and how they're usually at odds with each other we have to let the spirit be in control. He let the Holy Spirit teach him and show him, which I'll add this, like this is a great way to read the Bible. When you're reading the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants to show you in the passage. It doesn't mean that we should never go consult anyone. Wise like, that's, counsel. That's, yes, there is wise counsel. And eventually yeah. Paul does go to Jerusalem. Um, that's what it talks about in verse 13. Eventually he does go to Jerusalem to get confirmation that the word that he's been received and the calling that he's get received is being confirmed by the other apostles and the other those who w did walk with Jesus. That's good. And part of Paul's revelation is that he used to take this gospel to the Gentiles. And so we'll see that concept develop further. So Paul goes on, he talks about who, you know, he says that he talked to Cephas, who's Peter. He talked to James, the Lord's brother. And, and James was the leader. He was the respected leader of the church in Jerusalem. And then we get to the next section in chapter two, where basically Paul gets accepted by the apostles. And this is this is that confirmation that I was talking about. So Paul, he received his revelation. And after 14 years, it says, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And uh, he went, took the revelation uh privately before those who seemed influential. I read this a couple ways. First, when I first read it, I thought those who seemed, quote, influential, but then I realized that's not really not what he meant. It's like he, what he's saying <laughs> is that he's taking it privately to the known leaders of the church in Jerusalem at the time. So he's, he's going to these leaders and uh, explaining, hey, I'm to take the, the, the message. I've, I've got this commission. I'm supposed to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He's doing that. Why? To make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So, so he is aligning with the Spirit and aligning with those who the Spirit has already put an anointing and a calling on on as leaders in the church and so there's unity and mm. there's unity in direction and they agree that um yes that's that's what you're supposed to do so paul has received this revelation from god but he does consult those of high reputation because he understands the system of the world as well and that's the world we live in so we we are spiritual beings and we we commune with God and the spirit who lives in with it lives within us, but mm -hmm. we're still in this earth and have to abide by this, this world's laws and systems. It also establishes Paul's leadership and apostleship in Christ. So there's mutual um, affirming going on there and agreement. I think the important part is there's agreement. And then it goes on even in, you know, he talks more specifically about a kind of a hot topic issue back then, which was the issue of being circumcised. 
And I, as you can imagine, if you weren't circumcised, this would be something you'd want. Importantly, to be clarified whether this is necessary or not necessary to follow Christ. And every all the apostles were in agreement at this time that, you know, Paul, Peter, all of them, that no, it's not necessary for a Greek non-Jewish believer to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus. So they're not saying, hey, you don't circumcise your babies if you're Jewish. Like, that's fine. But what they're saying is that that is not, that is no longer necessary. That's not a, that's not a requirement for being saved. And this is those false gospel. This is kind of part of the false gospel that Paul's referring to because this was a major hot issue. People were coming into the church and basically saying, oh, well, this, this Jesus freedom stuff is all great. But, uh, but you know, if you're not circumcised, you're not going to go to heaven, right? Like they basically say that, and Paul's Paul's debunking that here. Verse six, he talks a little bit more about those who seem to be influential, but then he kind of also kind of tips his hand. And this is why I said it was kind of seeing it both ways, right? Because mm-hmm. he says like, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential added nothing to me. So. He's kind of saying like, hey, these seem to be the influencers in the church, but I'm going to do what God's calling me to do. And so he's creating agreement. But at the same time, he's also like, I'm I'm doing what what God is calling me to do. And he I I'm glad that there was agreement. I think that that's, you know, definitely the right thing. But at the same time, this is interesting. Like like you said, he wasn't wasn't really bowing down to. He wasn't bowing down to them just because they were influential. Mm. You know, I guess that's the important part that I'm trying to say here, right? Like, they seem to be influential. They seem to be the leaders of the church. But he's also basically just said in 3, 4, and 5, like, people are sneaking in, probably very influential people sneaking into the church Mm. and laying down a false false gospel. So Paul is kind of on the guard against, hey, are these people preaching the right thing? Are these truly the right leaders? Um, And... I was wondering if at the end of six there, when he says, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me, does it mean then that Paul's understanding of the gospel was complete? They didn't contribute any additional knowledge, not that they didn't contribute funds or give him a meal or something like that. Exactly. These influential leaders did not give him more to teach or change the teaching that he had. Then verse seven, eight, nine, he basically says they confirmed. Uh, when they saw I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. Um, uh, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and to they to the circumcised. So basically, they come into agreement. They agree. Paul and Barnabas is, are going to go to the Gentiles. They're going to go to the Greek cities, the Roman cities that aren't into the non-Jews and that James, Cephas, who's Peter and John are going to continue to um, uh, preach to the Jews, to the circumcised. And that's that's where and that's kind of where this agreement was formed. One of my favorite Bible teachers calls this a gentleman's agreement where they like you do this over here. I'll do that over there. It's the same message, though. Yeah. I wanted to point out when I read in verse nine, James, Cephas and John, I was like, oh, those are the three at the Mount at the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. And Donovan informed me that that's a different James. So right. this James here is Jesus's half brother, because the James that was present at the Mount of Transfiguration was killed in Acts 12 two. Yes. Sad. So when you said James is kind of in charge of the church at Jerusalem, it's the James, Jesus's half brother. Correct. Yes. Who was, who was not one of the 12. Right. Yeah. Actually, James's half brother didn't, or Jesus's half brother didn't believe, or, and Jude, who's another half brother of Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus until after his resurrection. So, so kind of like Paul, that yeah. Paul didn't believe as well until after Jesus's resurrection. Yes. I put a note here on this section, verse nine, that they had different call. Paul and Peter had different callings, but they knew who they were to minister to. Um, And I think we need to know as followers of Christ, who are we called to minister to? If you are in Christ, if you are a believer, then you have a calling. You maybe don't know what that calling is. 
maybe you haven't taken time to seek it. I know if I think for a long time, I didn't believe I had a calling and didn't want to have a calling Mm. because I didn't feel worthy. And we need to be seeking the Holy Spirit to understand what that ministry is. When I was early on in my spiritual walk, I almost didn't want to spend time with the Lord because I didn't want to hear him tell me to do something because then Mm. I'd be responsible to do that. I would need to be responsible or disobey. And so I almost just didn't want to spend time with the Lord because I didn't want to hear him tell me to do something. But I've grown since then and matured. And I have to say that the calling that the Lord has given you or whatever he's asking you to do will be so fulfilling. And I've seen that. I've lived that. You could answer the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So if that's something you are struggling with, just try to work past that. It will be worth it. It it leads to a, a Paul moment, right? Of like, he spent years, it says 14 years, you know, getting this mm. alignment of this heart. He knew that God was calling him and, and everywhere Paul went, he tries to preach to the Jews first, and then he goes to the Gentiles, but the Jews always reject him. So he ends up going to the Gentiles and that God prepared him for that. Paul takes that belief and stands up for it, which we see even against Peter later on um, in verses 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now I have to pause here because this word condemned because we read in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, right? So, well, Peter's in Christ. He's not saying he's condemned in the sense that he's not, not in Christ, right? And it's a different Greek word. And oh. so that's why they, there's similar roots, but different Greek word. Okay. So the word condemn, there's no condemnation in Romans 8, 1 is katakarima. Probably saying that wrong, but um, the root word to judge or sentence. So kind of this like, I'm sentencing you, but... The word ketagonisco, which is what the word condemned here is in my translation, where because he stood condemned, is basically to find fault with. So Paul found fault with Peter, saying that he was condemned. Why? Because in verse 12, he tells us, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And... The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jew by birth and not Gentile sinners. Basically, Paul is like, we are to reach out to the Gentiles. They are one. Uh, There's unity. There's no... Jew and Gentile in Christ anymore, that in in Christ, we are one with Christ and we're the same. And Paul sees Peter essentially backing off of this out of fear. So even though he's Peter, the rock, the, the leader of the church, like all of the disciples and apostles look up to him. In fact, other disciples were following him because mm. they were seeing him do this. The culture was ingrained in Peter so much that that old way of thinking, that pharisaical way of thinking that, oh, we need to separate ourselves from the Gentiles to be separate because we're Jews was still in, was still manifesting itself in Peter. And and Paul calls him out on it. Not, not to make himself look better or to make Peter look bad, simply to support the truth. And Barnabas, who was Paul's right-hand man, the person that Paul went to that believed in Paul when no one else believed in Paul and who went with Paul on his missions. Even Barnabas was led astray by this. So we see that it's okay for Paul, who's also an apostle, to call out Peter in what he's doing wrong. It's okay to call out our brothers and and even leaders if they're straying from the gospel and the truth. But it's not it doesn't mean it's open season to just criticize anything. Peter was was behaving in a way that was leading others away from unity in the church, away from the true gospel message of we're all one in Christ. And Paul called him out on it. It's pretty powerful considering what Paul has just written in chapter one, 
that you're accursed if you distort the gospel and preach it to others. And he's basically pointing out that Peter's doing that here. Yeah. But God well, but forgives God and, us. And but God forgives us. And Paul was being gracious to Peter to help guide guide him mm. back. Like that's that's good. He's guiding him back into into the truth. Then Paul gives the truth here in 16. Mm -hmm. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. The book of Galatians also repeats some of the ideas that we saw in Romans. I think some people have called it like a little mini Romans. Mm -hmm. So great ideas, these uh, justified by faith. And then he goes on to just talk more about that um, in verse 18 and 19. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. To say that the law is still required is to say that Christ's sufferings and death were not enough and were not necessary, which would make his act foolish or weak. And that is an essentially an insult to Christ. Christ's death and resurrection was all that we need. It was sufficient enough, not just for our sins, but for our, everyone's sins, not for our sins up until this moment, but our sins for all time, the sins we did before and the sins we'll do in the future. And not that, that we want to pile those sins up to just make his make his death even more powerful. Paul talks about that in Romans. We talked about that. But the reality is, is that nothing that I do, no amount of work will ever add to or enhance what Christ did and can't because Christ did was so sufficient. I have to go back to verse 18. It's good to think about don't rebuild what was already destroyed. And Paul's talking about that the law we're not under the law anymore. Now we're under faith. And I think it can be applied to other spiritual works that the Lord has done in our life. If you've been freed from the stronghold of an, of an addiction, don't rebuild that. Yes. And we have to be on guard. The, the victories you've been given in Christ are there and they're for us, but we have to hold fast to them. I think it says, it says that those term in another scripture we were studying, hold fast to the truth, hold fast. So it's this ongoing process. And I was encouraged by that. And I, I spent some time reflecting on that this week. Am I rebuilding anything that the Lord has destroyed that needs to stay destroyed? Hmm. That's good. Then verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think that is a probably one of the most powerful passages in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some identification that we need to be doing in this. Paul is doing this. He says, I have been crucified with the Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We need to make that our personal declaration and, and realization, not, not as like a magic chant, but just like we need to align, come in agreement with this. We need to come in that I am crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live. And because when we realize that we are crucified with Christ and, you know, other pastors talk about our sins being crucified, uh, nailed to the cross and our sin nature, you know, dying with Christ, like, all those things are dead in Christ and we are no longer the ones living. It's Christ who's living in us. And it's not, it's not self destructionism or like, Oh, I'm not no longer a person or whatever like that. It's, it's Christ becomes the Lord of our life. This is, this is Lordship in Christ, not just Christ's salvation. Although he talks about that, you know, but it's Christ's Lordship in our lives. And so we need to let Christ be the Lord so that as we live in this flesh, we live by faith in Jesus. And I love how it says he lo who loved me and gave himself for me. Like, I think we just need to remember that like the Lordship of Christ isn't a cold dictatorship. It's a love relationship that Christ loves us and that we get to be with him in a way that we can't be with any, any other person because Christ died for us so that we could have that relationship with him.
this verse, Galatians 2.20, was one of my memory verses that I did several years ago. And in order to memorize the verses, I would, I would work on them as I walked around the neighborhood and whatnot, just saying these to, over to myself. And there's something powerful that happens when you say that out loud, that God who loved me gave himself up for me. Mm-hmm. You just believe it more when you, you say that out loud to yourself. Try that this week. Yeah. Make this a memory verse for yourself. Repeat it to yourself. It will bless you very much. Yeah. Well, and just, yeah, meditate on this verse. Like, take that as your Bible challenge. This is this is a powerful truth and reminds me of that Phillips Craig and Dean song, I've Been Crucified with Christ. It makes me want to go play that. But that brings us to the end. I mean, verse 20, 21 says, I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And I talked a little bit about that before with 18 and 19. If you could get righteousness through through the law, then why did Christ have to do what he had to do? And the fact that we couldn't do it and Christ stepped up to do it just shows that how loving he is because he could have just wiped us all out and started fresh with a mm. whole new world and a whole new people and, wow. you know, but he didn't. Wow. because he loved us so i really saw I, I love the idea going back to chapter one of being being a god pleaser not a men pleaser a, a people pleaser and i think that's what kind of led peter astray here in chapter two he mm. wanted to please the men that came that particular uh, the people that came from jerusalem and that led him astray so this idea about pleasing God, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I've been collecting verses on pleasing God and I got to this chapter and I was like, oh, it's right here. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Making our aim to please God and not men is a good thing. One, because it protects us from perverting the gospel, from, from doing things we shouldn't be doing, from being a hypocrite. <laughs> it's easy to say, hard to do. Yeah. But through Christ, I can do all things. We hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you next week. Bye.